Today, we want to focus on a rather recent development of the last decade of AI and its potential future. The question of AI regulation and trust in AI applications specifically. Let me welcome um, our uh, distinguished experts uh, and we're really happy to have you uh, three here. Um, let me start with uh, Virginia Dignam. Uh, Virginia is a professor in social and ethical AI at uh, Umea University and Wallenberg Chair on Responsible Artificial Intelligence. Uh, she is involved in uh, many of today's um, um, policy and uh, regulatory initiatives on AI. She, for example, is a member of the European Commission High Level Expert Group on Artificial Intelligence, the World Economic Forum Council on AI, the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethically Aligned Design of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, the, design, uh, the Delft Design for Values Institute, the European Global Forum on AI, uh, AI for People, the Re Responsible Robotics Foundation, the Dutch AI Alliance on AI, and the ADA AI Foundation. Maybe I forgot uh, even a few. Um, we also um, very warmly welcome Christian Kastik um, to this discussion today. Uh, Christian is a full professor for, uh, at the Computer Science Department and head of the uh, at uh, TU Darmstadt and uh, head of the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Lab. They are also a member of the Center for Cognitive uh, Science, um, um, a faculty of the Ellis unit in, in Darmstadt. Uh, and he's um, also founding co-director of the Hessian Center for Artificial Intelligence. You can see all the logos, I think, in his uh, Zoom background uh, back there. Uh, he has also published um, quite extensively in, uh, in publicly available, so newspaper and, uh, and open discourse um, uh, initiatives, like, for example, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Die Welt, and others. He is also a fellow of the European Association for Artificial Intelligence, uh, a fellow of the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems, and so, uh, and so on. And he's, uh, he received just recently the inaugural German AI Award uh, in 2019. Um, uh, last but not least, uh, let's welcome uh, Matthias Spielkamp uh, to, the, to our discussion today. Matthias Spielkamp is co-founder and executive director of Algorithm Watch, um, the, uh, an initiative and uh, NGO looking at the role and effects of automated decision-making systems in many aspects of modern society, an initiative that just uh, won in 2018 the Theodore Poiss Medal and the Grimmer Online uh, was a Grimmer Online nominee in 2019. Uh, Matthias is also a member of the Global Partnership on AI uh, together with Virginia and we'll probably uh, get to talk about some of the, their shared experience there. Um, and he's um, uh, serving uh, on, on a few governing boards on, uh, in, in various uh, technology and AI um, developments uh, today. Um, he has studied um, journalism and, uh, and philosophy a long time ago, so um, also um, this uh, to an introduction. Um, we welcome this wonderful round of experts and I hope uh, for a very lively discussion uh, today. As always, you as uh, an audience are already uh, invited to, um, to participate in our discussion using the Q&A function while we are uh, discussing among us. Um, you find the Q&A button on the uh, right uh, lower side of your Zoom uh, window, so just use it extensively to drop in questions, maybe also use the chat, chat to, to drop in questions. Uh, we will take around 45 to 60 minutes uh, for a discussion among the panelists, and then we'll, we'll open up the floor also to questions from the audience. Um, once we've done that, you can also um, just uh, give notice of a question or a comment by just raising virtually your hand uh, and then uh, Hayo and Rudi will take care that you uh, get a voice in, in this discussion. So um, without further ado, let's start our um, discussion on AI algorithms, uh, trust and regulation today. And I would like you uh, I would like to start off this discussion with a more uh, with a quite general uh, question and I uh, would like to uh, like all three of you to share your thoughts and perspectives uh, on, on this. Uh, from your perspectives, what do you think has changed in terms of AI as a set of technologies, but also in terms of the public and political discussions on AI that has put regulation and trustworthiness front and center in the last, let's say, 10, 15 uh, years? Um, Virginia, would you like to start? 
Yes, sure. Thank you for your question. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this debate today. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, fundamentally, what has changed or what has what is the the, the issue with AI today is the change or the, the, the reliance on data uh, data driven methods uh, as the basis for uh, the the systems that are being built today so until uh, the, the, those techniques were already existing for quite some uh, several decades now but the possibility of uh, using uh, increasingly amounts of data and increasingly large computational power has brought forward the possibility of identifying patterns in huge amounts of data and base uh, the, the the intelligence the design of intelligent technologies on this possibility of identifying patterns. Before this, what we were being do, were doing in AI was crafting by hand carefully all the rules, the reasoning uh, 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 characteristics of a specific uh, intelligent task and the, with the costs and the, the difficulty of doing that all by hand. With using the, uh, the data-driven approaches, we are able to do a lot of this work by uh, using machines, uh, using automatic uh, identification of these patterns, which has a huge potential. And we have seen the, the developments in AI as it is today is based on the potentials of this type of technologies. But at the same time, and that going to the, the issue of regulation and the issue of trust, it brings with, uh, with it re the realization that these patterns in data are often uh, not uh, expect, or at least not always give the expected uh, result, uh, are based on the data that uh, that exists. And data is not a raw material; it's always constructed by people, one way or another. It's collected, is decided what uh, what are the characteristics, what are the properties. It's all uh, decided by by people, so it's never it's it's all always a construct. Uh, and with these constructs, uh, it brings into the into the decision making by the machines all kinds of issues of bias, of uh, discrimination, of incompleteness, not by design, but because of the way that the systems are doing. So what we are realizing is that actually the techniques that we are using, uh, uh, what we call AI, is neither artificial nor intelligent. And that is what brings the need. And I will, I, I can talk about that now or later. But uh, the issue, the whole issue of trust, the whole issue of regulation comes with this the fact that we are relying increasingly on decisions taken by systems which we don't fully understand, which are not intelligent in the same way as people are intelligent, and at the same time are extremely uh, based not on an artificial type of uh, uh, design, but uh, represent and bring forward and uh, replicate those power issues, those bias, those discrimination that exist in uh, in our world, but then makes multiplies that. Uh, with the, the amount of data that is being used. Just let's start. We can continue. We have some time. Wonderful. Christian, would you like to um, continue? Sure. Happy to continue. So first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I, I think I will learn much more than I can contribute, but let's see. Um, <clears throat> so somehow Virginia said already the major points here. On the other hand, I would like to add that I disagree about the artificial and the intelligence part in the following sense. Um, AI is a research discipline, at least as well, right? And <clears throat> it's like now arguing physics is not doing what physics has promised to do because physics still don't understand Big Bang. Sure, I mean, I think that's what we all are used to. So we should understand and maybe distinguish two fields or two directions within AI. And one is the scientific discipline, which is has a partner, uh, twin science and in cognitive science, but maybe also psychology and to sex, uh, some extent in philo uh, philosophy, where we want to understand the fundamental laws at some point, maybe in 100 years, maybe in 10,000 years, I, I don't know, the fundamental laws of intelligence. What, what does it make 
we can now debate an object, an entity, whatever, a person, intelligent or not. And it's always these both sides. So, so this more scientific question I would like to separate from the push where I fully agree with uh, Virginia, um, coming from the companies, the big companies on selling everything being almost on par with humans. And that's not true. We are far, far away from human uh, level AI. Maybe some people don't even want that. So, but we should separate these two questions because one is really the question, what does it mean to be smart, intelligent? I think that's a wonderful scientific question. And the other one is how do people, companies right now try to make money out of that? And this is where Virginia made wonderful contributions already. Um, and and, and I, I agree there. Now you were asking about regulation and there I feel like, you know, what was happening is we grew up, no one was really taking AI serious. Now they take it serious. And the problem is that it's, it was done in a short time of period, right? And now we have to understand how to regulate in a short time of period as well, at least for the beginning. So this is where I hope that this regulation, which for me is completely normal. I mean, we know that from medicine, from even physics that I was talking about. So, so I'm, I'm not surprised by that. I'm happy about that. It's normal, we should do it. Not everything that is possible should be done. But I hope that it's a form of a dance in a sense that we are doing here because what I see right now is quite often we still compare with humans, although we are far, far away from there. Um, and, and that makes me nervous because if I start from humans and um, try to regulate AI from the human perspective, that's an unfair business. And we should be open enough to regulate um, in, a, in a more adaptive or dynamic fashion. That's what I think. Matthias. I'm already benefiting a lot from uh, this discussion here, uh, even from the first, uh, the, only the first two answers to your question. And uh, the, the one thing that I can add to what has been said already, and I entirely agree with that, is that um, the more you look into the topic, um, the more um, difficult it becomes to answer that question that you posed. Um, I, I'm discussing this with a lot of people, you know, a lot of the time. What is it that makes this so fascinating now for the regulator, also for a general public? Um, I think it's easy to answer the question, what makes it attractive for companies? Because as both Virginia and Christian already said, is they use it as a marketing tool and it works wonderfully. We have all these images in our minds uh, from science fiction books and movies and these stories. Um, that uh, play with this idea of predictability and that we can predict the future. And now we have systems that seem to, at least uh, to some extent, make this promise come true. And um, this inspires many people to think that we are close to not just intelligence that is similar to human intelligence, which I don't think is at all the case. And I think we all agree with that in the room here, um, but even be able or is able um, to make predictions about the future, which is, you know, in a certain sense, ridiculous in a different sense, you know, um, when you're just talking about probabilities, there's something to it, of course, right? I mean, we have always, I mean, not always, but since uh, we started thinking about probabilities and statistics and all this, we have tried to uh, make predictions on the grounds of this, but we also have to acknowledge what the limits are. So this is why it's easy to understand why companies think this is a wonderful marketing tool. And I think what I can add to this discussion from my perspective is that as an activist, in a sense, uh, someone who works in a civil society organization and tries to influence the uh, governance of it, is that... Um, um, there are these huge misunderstandings about the powers of AI. And therefore, um, we also have this very interesting discussion about the governance that is uh, sort of going both ways. On the one hand, people are arguing that, oh, just leave it alone. You know, we need to be able to innovate. Um, and uh, there, there are risks um, that are coming with that. And then on the other hand, um, many people who... Um, I think have not understood this in a sufficient way. Uh, and I would certainly count myself among those people, you know, who have not understood this in a sufficient way, but I'm not a, 
lawmaker, uh, coming up with very, very uh, far-reaching ideas of uh, how to regulate this. And this is, this is of course, uh, a, um, a dynamic that is uh, very interesting, um, but you know, it can be problematic. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here because I think this will follow us through the entire <laughs> discussion today. It's great to see that the uh, discussion already starts. Christian and Virginia have already uh, raised hands to reply. So I think Christian was first. Christian, please. <clears throat> well, not reply. I just want to point out it, what makes it even more tricky is that many of the companies we implicitly talk about are also driving the basic research, right? So, so it's when I say let's separate, it's, it's hard, right? Because they are so... Uh, putting so much money also into research that this is hard and I wanted to just separate because sometimes I get the impression you know if I say oh companies do something wrong then all my friends at these companies feel offended because they just do basic research in their opinion right so I just wanted to clarify that makes it even harder sometimes the, the discussion because it gets very quickly emotional. No. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, thank you for the clarification. And uh, thank you, Christian, to remind us that AI fundamentally is a scientific field of research, a, a field in which we try by artificial means or by computational means, understand what is intelligence in general. So it's a much more philosophical and much more uh, fundamental type of research than what we are using it nowadays in, uh, in, let's say, in real life. It is also not the scientific field, which is, in my opinion, what the regulators and uh, um, other organizations are concerned about. Uh, and then it is also all, and uh, Matthias has referred to that as well, it, has, it is an issue of narrative. Uh, what exactly are we regulating? Is that the magical kind of system which we don't really understand, but somehow is going to predict the future and know all about us and do all kinds of potentially wonderful things for us? There are also the scientific fiction, scientific fiction version in which it all goes wrong, but we'll leave that one for a moment. Or it is the, let's say, the business as usual. And in this street, I Dimensional in which I would like to, from the perspective of the regulation, the fundamental research dimension is the one which is the least interesting or the least um, uh, relevant for the legislation at this moment, at least as the way that uh, regulation and guidelines is uh, are being drafted. But the other one, this dimension between, in one end, the business as usual, of course, it's obvious that we are big companies and other companies and all of us can benefit from this next step in uh, digitization to the dimension of the, the magic entity, which is going to predict all kinds of things. That's where in this dimension is where the, the, the regulation field is struggling to find the position. Uh, if you read some of these guidelines, some of these, even the, the AI Act uh, that you just referred before, uh, that the European Union is uh, putting forward as concrete regulation. Sometimes you have the feeling they are trying to regulate the magic. Other times they are trying to regulate everything, any computational. Actually, the definition which appears in this AI Act includes any piece of uh, program ever written. So it's kind of uh, a difficulty here to find out where exactly should we be positioning ourselves in terms of what needs to be regulated. And from my part, I actually think that it's not about regulating AI. AI is about regulating the impact of automated decision making for what, by whatever means it is, whether it is a technique that we would call AI or is someone rolling a dice somewhere else or a, some machine rolling dice. The, the technique shouldn't really be the issue. I think the issue from the regulation perspective is the impact of this automatization and this um, um, large-scale automated decisions that are happening nowadays. Christian, another? Yeah, no, 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 just uh, I, I think because everyone always feels like there's this machine that can predict everything, and that always sounds like there's the machine that can find the world formula and solve everything. 
that is provably wrong, right? So just to remind all of us, <clears throat> Gödel has proven that, and it's really fascinating if you read not only the proof, but the whole discussion around it, because there was already once, maybe more often, this time in history where people felt like, oh, we can find this single solution to everything. And it's, at least if you take a logical perspective, uh, it's provably wrong. Now you may argue maybe not all the questions we are interested uh, in are covered by Gödel, but anyhow, I wanted to remind everyone there. And then I wanted to also um, apologize everyone because it's it's clear that it's super hard to define what regulation even in the automatic decision systems regime why that is so hard because in any ai class you learn that there are qualification ramification and all the other problems to write down precisely what does it mean to show intelligent behavior right it's super hard and so that's why i really hope and i think that's where in the eu i see a much better movement we are much more open-minded to understand the other side that it's hard, first of all, right? And still it's necessary. And we, I, I, I see a dialogue happening. Uh, the third dimension I just wanted to mention is that was uh, raised somehow by Matthias and also Virginia, thanks for that. I think we also have to invest in parallel into something like educating the, the mass or the, the public because it's unfair what we do here. We discuss on an elite level already, what is AI, <clears throat> but we actually argue we have to protect the mass. So additionally, to get it at some point fair as in a, demo a democracy, I think we also have to invest much more into this public education. Sorry, it was a bit like, yeah. Just reacting quickly on uh, Christian, thank you very much for the, the reminding us of that. It is not only that, uh, like Godel says, we cannot compute everything, we cannot, uh, uh, intelligence is not computable, but on the other hand, we also have to demystify this idea that human minds are information processing machines. So we are, as well, intelligence in from a human perspective is not a one-dimensional thing, is also not one thing which can be Com uh, described computationally, fully described computationally. So there, there is um, there is an intersection between uh, what uh, human machines, uh, human mind can do that we call intelligence. It intersects what, what machines can do that can be, uh, that we can call intelligence. But both of them are fundamentally different. And I also think that uh, designing or developing AI systems. Uh, of course, uh, the, the fundamental uh, research idea is to try to understand intelligence, but we do that in many different ways and not just in the way of uh, trying to build or emulate uh, fully the human mind in the same way that we have developed airplanes which can fly and fly in a completely different way that uh, uh, birds fly, uh, we can try to approach uh, intelligence, human intelligence or animal intelligence in many different ways, which is not necessarily by the same uh, techniques or the same methods or the same uh, approaches that uh, human mind uh, dis defines intelligence. So we do need to demystify both the power of what uh, machines can do, and uh, there is a limit to what we can compute, but also at the same time try to demystify the fact that, that uh, intelligence is more than uh, just what can be computed, let's say. Uh, yeah, I think I can leave it here for now. It's wonderful. If, if I can a... jump in yes, very please. quickly, Virginia, I, I would love to invite you for an another meeting at some point, because I think this is where I disagree, but that's also, you have to understand, I'm also partly a computational cognitive scientist. And so I think it's a super interesting discussion how far algorithms really run in the brain or can be used to describe human behavior or not. But I think that's going too far for, for the today panel, but I would love to discuss that more. I would, for example, disagree with Penrose, but maybe that's also by education. Let, let's see. It's actually wonderful to see a panel it, discussing without intervention and also uh, finishing <laughs> off discussions of questions without intervention. Lovely, really but, lovely. 
but it's good to, to, to agree to disagree and to uh, understand that there are many different approaches and many different views to, to what, uh, what can or cannot be done with AI and what, uh, what the aim of it is. So indeed, Christian, I would love to discuss this further in another opportunity. Wonderful. So there are also different approaches actually to, to regulation, as um, was already mentioned in passing by Christian and by Matthias and uh, Virginia in, in answering and discussing the last questions. So um, very different ones uh, in different uh, national um, regulatory approaches, very different ones. If you look at the EU, for example, if you look at industry actors, if you look at uh, various um, uh, scientific and uh, or um, commercially um, driven scientific uh, committees. So there are different approaches of regulation and, and to deal with or suggested to deal with some of the known and or still unknown effects of current AI de developments, such as um, uh, the ones that Virginia already mentioned in the beginning, like bias, unfairness, or uh, the question of, uh, of the black box nature of machine learning based models. Um, and also there are different, um, different paradigms, one might say, that these regulatory schemes work with, like transparency, accountability, ex explainability as a, as, a, as, a, um, as, an, as, a, as a requirement for certain systems, to name just a few. Um, if you look at that landscape of suggestions of where regulation should be, should be heading to, what, where um, uh, we should uh, um, discuss potential legal and also normative interventions. Which one of these approaches uh, do you find most convincing uh, and why, or maybe uh, which one of these do you find absolutely non-convincing and maybe also have some reasons why? Uh, Virginia, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, yes, indeed, there are many approaches and many flavors to regulation as there are many flavors to AI or to anything else. Uh, I, I don't think, or at least most of them, I think they are not incompatible with each other. And also we do need to have, uh, probably to have many different approaches to regulation in order to really uh, address all the issues that come with the, the use of this type of technology. So the, uh, there are, of course, the uh, I usually talk about governance to cover all of them, uh, one of them being regulation in terms of uh, hard national or sectorial or regional type of uh, legal approaches to uh, determine in a, in a legal way, which is also then me measurable and uh, um, uh, controllable what what should be done what should not be done not, not all like I, I think Christian already or uh, one of Christian or Matthias already said not all what can be done should be done so we do need to have this type of legal definitions legal uh, uh, frames in which we know this is uh, thing, uh, uh, aspects that can be done these are issues which cannot be done these are the impact of doing things in one way or another so the, the regulation the legal regulation Regulation is one aspect. The other one, the other approach, which I think can very easily be combined with a regulatory approach, is standardization. Standardization is a more, let's say, technical or organizational approach, which supports regulation by indicating how can we go about, how can we set up the process, how can we set up the the, the products and the services that are being developed in a way that they will, if, if you follow these standards, you know that you are aligned with uh, specific legal or other types of regulation. So both of them uh, can, and uh, we see already that they are supporting each other. Uh, then finally, we also have uh, approaches concerning, um, which we see mostly in larger companies, the more soft regulation, the ethics boards or the AI, uh, uh, chief AI officer, chief, chief ethical officers, which provide the company in one end, a type of uh, um, differentiation, a type of also uh, describing, this is what we as a company stand for. This is what we as a company uh, um, really uh, think that are the issues that we want to uh, put forward to uh, regulate within our company, even if it outside uh, is not regulated yet or not governed yet. It, it, we have seen quite some problems 
to these approaches, but in other hand, it we, from other industries, we see that this also can provide differentiation, but in a, in a differentiation in a sense of um, more principled approaches to uh, to develop products and services. We have seen that in the food industry with the fair trade, with the organic and the other types of um, differentiation. And we see that uh, slowly appearing in the AI uh, related or AI, uh, technology companies. And the, the last but not least, I think the, 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 current, the, the current to the whole thing is what Christian already referred to, is education and awareness. Uh, without having a public uh, opinion which is minimally informed what AI can, cannot do, what is already happening in terms of uh, automated decision making in, in our lives, in our daily lives, and how that is being impacting our lives and how is that minimally um, uh, being implemented. Uh, no one will have a sufficient hard voice to participate in the discussion. And we really need the public, we need the citizens of, and, and the uh, different organizations to participate in the discussion and to indicate what are, from, from, from our perspective as users, as uh, citizens, what do we want or not to uh, see implemented with AI in our, um, in our countries, in our uh, uh, service and products that we are using. Matthias, your organization uh, is also involved in many of these um, approaches, actually, and you're uh, one of the editors of the Automated Society, Automating Society report. You're, you have just, as, a, as an organization, released this, uh, this Atlas of Automation, um, or, um, I think even in its second version now, so maybe um, you have some experiences to share from a very practical point of view, but also from a, from a legal and, uh, and a regulatory uh, interventionist point of view. Sure. So, so uh, what we've already understood here, and I think this is really important, is that um, what the regulators are trying to do at the moment, at least if they are prudent, is to understand better what the impacts of the uses of these systems are. And I use the term systems because we think of um, automated decision-making systems as socio-technical systems that are always embedded in a context. This may be trivial to the people who are here and who are listening to the discussion, um, but I don't think uh, it is trivial and it needs uh, always to be uh, understood here because just take the uh, example of um, um, face recognition and other biometric technologies that are uh, really hyped at the moment and that are being used everywhere. And then we have this discussion about bias in these systems, for example, you know, so uh, dark faces are recognized with less accuracy than light faces. Now, this is a problem, right? Of course, this is a problem. You know, you can look at this and argue that there should be an accuracy that really uh, uh, um, is, is it matches between the different uh, skin tones, because uh, other things imply that there is, let's say, uh, racial uh, bias or even discrimination embedded into this and so on and so forth. This is all true. Um, but the bigger question, of course, is should we be using these technologies at all and for what purposes, right? So, um, and, and then it becomes a question that uh, sort of um, um, breaks the boundaries of this discussion about artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and, and bias and so on. And therefore it also becomes um, enormously complex. And we can see that um, looking at the regulatory proposals that have come out in the recent months, uh, mainly the so-called Digital Services Act that is looking at large platforms and that what was then combined with the Digital Markets Act, um, now taking, let's say, different, uh, the Commission argues, complementary approaches to regulating the large platforms, very large platforms, and also smaller platforms. Um, and then uh, also the uh, AI Act, the regulation for artificial intelligence that was already mentioned and that there are problems with that. For example, you know, if you look at the definition of artificial intelligence and basically you are, uh, are, you are looking at a definition of software and is that really appropriate um, for, for this? So um, in that sense, I cannot um, argue that um, we are closer 
to a meaningful regulation of what we are looking at. But it's a very, very important start of a discussion. Start in the sense that the most important regulator, at least for Europe, and probably at the moment, the most aggressive regulator um, in the world, is thinking hard about how to cope with these challenges. And in a sense, you know, I appreciate that. Of course, you can always be very critical about this and look at the details, and uh, this is what we are doing. But at the same time, um, it is necessary that someone does that. And the problem, of course, is there can always be harm in that as well. You know, if you do it wrong, um, in the sense of be careful what you wish for, uh, you have you can have unforeseen consequences. I don't even want to call them unintended consequences because that is something else, but unforeseen consequences of regulation. And um, I'll give you one example because this is all very abstract that I'm talking about, but I'll give you one example and that is the platform regulation itself, where we are looking into uh, the question of, um, for example, content. How is content moderated? How is content curated? How is content amplified on social media platforms? And immediately you are talking about uh, the content itself and what is acceptable content and what is acceptable content in one country is unacceptable content in another country. And if you look at this closely, you're not talking about artificial intelligence at all anymore. You're talking about content regulation, which is dangerous, dangerous in the sense, you know, that um, actually in the societies we live in, we want very little content regulation done by governments. Of course, we don't want people to be able to um, uh, to incite violence. We don't want to uh, want people to be allowed to just um, 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 uh, use uh, slurs against other people and uh, all these things. This is, this is a given. I mean, it's a given here. Um, the Americans already have a different take on this when you look at their idea of, um, of uh, freedom of speech. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, overlap. But then, you know, how do you deal with that when it comes to platforms? Um, in a sense that you don't risk censorship, for example, you know, so um, giving you that example to at least try to uh, for everyone to be able to imagine the complexities in this. And because of this, there's like one thing that I would like to put out here and I would be very, very interested to hear uh, Virginia's and, and Christian's uh, reactions to that is that we at the moment as an organization focus on the demand for transparency and transparency you know to some people it's like a trigger word the reactions are immediately ah transparency yes but transparency is not a panacea right transparency is not a, a solution to anything now uh, imagine you find out that there's a bad system oh okay so it's transparent but what if you can't do anything about it what if you are still subject to that um, uh, bad system what what good is transparency but the reason why we are arguing that there is so much value in transparency at the moment is that it if it is regulated and if it is enforced that there is a higher level of transparency it is the basis for a better discussion about what is actually going on where are possible harms what are possible mitigations for these harms uh, and this is why we so strongly advocate for um, for transparency instead of and i'm coming back to the example of uh, uh, speech uh, again instead of going directly into arguing that Algorithms, for example, must not amplify this and that message because that is an entirely different discussion and uh, it's, it's just very, very contextual uh, and we don't have any clear solutions for that at the moment. Virginia, maybe that's a direct re reaction to... Yes, on the issue of transparency. Uh, I, I fully agree on what uh, Algorithmic Watch is trying to do, but the issue, transparency, it's... Uh, like most of these concepts, uh, interpret differently by different people and by different organizations. And depending on how you interpret it, it might or not be useful in the sense that you are uh, aiming at. It, it, I can be very transparent by 
sharing with you the code of the systems that I'm building, and I just dumped all code on you here. This is what I did. Uh, please be, be happy with it. Most of us would not be happy to uh, or able to understand at all what this code is doing and what are the implications of having do, done the code in one way or another. So this type of transparency uh, is it, it is being transparent, but in a sense is not really being very useful. What I think it's really more relevant and what needs to be uh, more uh, demanded is a matter of openness in terms of the choices that have been done, the options that were involved, who has been making these decisions, who has been involved in the discussions, how has been uh, the, the selection and the criteria to select one or another type of uh, option, one, one or another type of algorithm, one or another type of data set. Openness about this whole process, I think it's probably much more relevant than uh, algorithmic transparency in terms of sharing and opening the code to uh, to to other to to everybody. And uh, if we go back to the um, to uh, other types of industries, it, it's not. Uh, I I don't need to get the, um, the specifications of the of a car in order to trust whether or not this car uh, is safe, is reliable, is um, is uh, uh, doing what is expected. To do there are of course there are a whole uh, uh, history of um, uh, trust in the in the those that will the cars there is a, a whole this uh, definition or uh, decisions in terms of minimal viable uh, quality for the products that are there and that i think that standardization can help there uh, and of course we need to have a much stronger uh, infrastructure or um, um, not infrastructure but uh, uh, governmental uh, definition of what can be or cannot be uh, done by these systems. So in a sense, the trans th there are many ways to understand transparency and not all of them I think are as useful from the perspective of the users or if you take it the other way around, from the perspective of the regulators. That seems to be a direct reply by Matthias. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it's actually a case in point because this is what I meant when I said, you know, we need to understand first what we are talking about. And to, uh, sometimes this transparency thing is a very much a trigger word because, for example, as Algorithm Watch, we have never asked for publication of the code as like a fundamental um, requirement for anything. There can be certain um, cases where we would find that necessary. You know, when it's uh, about uh, um, safety relevant things, uh, when uh, people's lives are uh, dependent on it, there, there could be the requirement of a code audit, you know, by someone who is qualified to do it. Of course, this would not be me, right? Because uh, um, um, I, I have no clue uh, how to uh, audit uh, code. Um, but uh, it, it, it's sort of problematic to talk about this in very abstract terms. For example, what we have done um, in one of our recent projects is we worked with the Canton of Zurich in Switzerland uh, because they um, uh, commissioned us with a report on the uh, ethical and legal implications of uh, using AI systems in the public service. And uh, one of the outcomes of that report or one of the pieces of that report is uh, an impact assessment tool that uh, I would argue is doing exactly what you're asking for, Virginia. It is a set of questions that um, asks who was responsible for the development, what decisions were being made when um, the, the, the design uh, of the model uh, was thought about, uh, and much more, of course. Uh, we also published this in English. I mean, as a sort of, you know, this, this impact assessment, the report itself is in German, but the impact assessment we also translated and published it in German because we think it could be a valuable contribution to the discussion. And this is what uh, I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, making things transparent behind the use of these AI-based systems. Um, so, um, of course, many people understand many things um, when they hear transparency, uh, and then it's even more important to uh, sort of clarify. But this is like it would take 
ages, even for us here, uh, being well informed about this, to come to um, a conclusion. Um, but I, I think um, we need to work more on this. And for example, I entirely agree with you on this matter of standardization. Again, that is something that I would like to hear Christian's, Christian's uh, view on as well. Uh, standardization and also uh, process uh, audits, uh, because I think they, they present a huge opportunity. And again, this is then part of the transparency I'm talking about. If we have a set of, let's say, uh, conformity indicators, which is difficult enough when we're talking about these systems, you know, to agree on them. But if we had a, a set of conformity indicators uh, and there would be an audit being done, yes, of course, we need to see the result or the outcome of this audit, or at least some people need to see it. If it is like, uh, for example, uh, something that is used in police, in policing or um, other uh, let's say rather secret uh, instances, it, there could even be the option that it's only a government body or a parliamentarian body or a court that reviews then the reports of these audits. Um, and this all needs to be discussed on a case by case basis. I mean, not on a case by case basis in the sense of for each system, but for the different uh, ways that they are applied in, in, in practice. Now we have both hands up, uh, yeah. but I think Virginia's was first, and then Christian yeah. maybe uh, is a reply to also the standardization issue yeah. or yeah. something else yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, Matthias. And uh, indeed, we are very much aligned, I think, in what uh, what you are doing on uh, on transparency and what we in my group we are also working on uh, assessment uh, methods. And uh, uh, we have some uh, some work done on uh, definition of uh, ass assessments in terms of this type of questions, like uh, the ones I referred to. And you, we are, uh, but at the same time, uh, Two, I would like to refer two things. Uh, one is that uh, for whatever, or for many different types of reasons, full transparency might not always be possible, either because of uh, IP uh, type of issues, either because of national security type of issues, either because of the complexity of the system. It's uh, So there, are, there might be uh, many different types of uh, reasons for which uh, full transparency might not be the most efficient or the most uh, useful um, approach. We are also working on what we call the, the glass box in opposition to the black box. And the, the glass box approach is to uh, take an observer perspective on a black box. So I try to guarantee, to provide guarantees and uh, limits to what a, uh, Whatever glass box, whatever black box is, we uh, provide some uh, computational guarantees that whatever this box is doing, even if we cannot look inside the box, we can guarantee that uh, it will not uh, uh, violate some types of principles. So that's a more observ observational and uh, um, Monit uh, controlling type of approach over the glass box. So, in principle, the, the sorry, the black box could do uh, many different things, but we guarantee that in a specific context, it will never uh, exceed a certain type of limits as an alternative um, uh, approach. And finally, from a research perspective, uh, transparency of code is something which we are increasingly asking for. We are asking in uh, uh, scientific conferences and journals for uh, uh, for us and our peers to publish their code, to uh, also to support the possibility of replicate the uh, replicate the results and the approaches that the, the claims that are being done by different researchers. So it's if if from a regulation perspective maybe. Uh, uh, transparency of code is not the most um, useful or uh, uh, necessary type of thing. From a scientific perspective, there is a big push in exactly on that, because only in that way we can really verify the, um, the claims that we, each other are making and also can try to replicate those type of claims. Okay, uh, quite a lot of ideas. Uh, super interesting. I'm not saying that I can answer or comment on all of them, but let me let me try some. So 
first of all, and maybe I'm a bit naive here, maybe we can replace transparency more like uh, by the term honesty. Maybe that helps, I don't know. I mean, maybe now Matthias will tell me or would tell me, ah, come on, I know that companies are not honest, M might, might be. Uh, but I think that's what we are talking about, or trust. I think that's what Virginia was talking about. Um, so so my, my problem is with um, transparency. Uh, I like it to some extent, but um, as Virginia said, it may get to the level of details that it's counterproductive. Now, I agree that standardization and maybe sandboxes, test centers might be a good step, but we have I think, to be honest, to tell people AI is not about perfect systems. AI is, to some extent, to a larger extent, the science of imperfectionism. I mean, it's about imperfect machines. Even if you agree that, I mean, AI is not just looking at humans, right? It's about intelligent behavior per se. But if you focus on humans, we humans are not perfect. And so I get always, because I take this research pers perspective, a bit puzzled why people always assume that <clears throat> machines are perfect. And I think in the, in the US, this is less of the tradition, but in Germany, because we are engineers and we like our machines, seems like everyone expects machines have to be perfect and true all the time. But yeah, anyhow, so, so I just wanna uh, make this point and from there, if we get sandboxes or tests, maybe you have to do them um, again and again, right? It's a bit like a TÜV. What is TÜV in English? I don't know. Um, there is a translation. I once checked it. But it's this institutional or more almost governmental institution where, where you have to go and with your car and see that it still works properly. Still, no one... Uh, implies from that, that the next three days, there might not be a breakdown, right? So we have to get used to that. And that's where Virginia also, when she was now saying we have to educate people and so on, I, I think that's really important. But I also would like to cite here uh, Edgar uh, Dijkstra, you know, a very famous um, computer scientist. And he said, if debugging is the process of removing software bugs, then programming must be the process of putting them in. And that's what we have to understand, right? It always feels like when we regulate, we feel like they are bad guys and they're sitting somewhere and they say, yippee, I put now bucks in there that will change society. I think that's also a little bit over the top. And we have to understand when we figure out something goes wrong, Matthias was pointing out face detection or even human face detection, I mean, person detection, indeed something goes wrong and it tells us um, these algorithms still haven't understood what is a face. I'm with you there, Matthias. But maybe in two years they are, or maybe in 20 years. And there are applications uh, where I would love to use these tools. Uh, for example, if you go for some work, uh, I know now people may scream uh, together with the police, and particularly if we think of uh, child pornography, I, I would love to reduce the bullshit that some of the police men and women have to look at um, just to understand and go for the court. And there are other issues then involved, but I think there are some, some interesting applications. So that's why I was always saying, yes, uh, honesty, and that's where then model cards play, come into play, glass boxes come into play, tests come into play. And Virginia, you were saying infrastructure. I think, sorry, uh, Europe need infrastructure, compute infrastructure in order to run these tests. Otherwise, we build up these ideas about testing. And then we say, OK, um, big company ABC, we want to test. And they give us a model that we can't even evaluate. How, how stupid would that be? So that's what we have to put in place, in my opinion, uh, somewhere. And I think testing can be the only really game here because um, I think otherwise, you know, what we are talking about seems to be what we call AI complete. So uh, the AI community used this word in order to describe if you can solve that task, then you have also solved AI. To, to an extent you can all choose now, human level or general level or whatever. 
So we have to be a bit careful that, you know, why, why not don't, I mean, that's why I like what Matthias said, let's start somewhere. And it's important to have the discussion, but let's see it as a moving target, which doesn't mean that we can't come up with rules. I'm happy with rules, right? But once in a while, maybe we have to revise them. Um, and that's also what I know a bit from medicine. It's not like they put one rule in place and then it stays for eternity, but that's where I'm a bit scared. So now Matthias, that doesn't mean I'm, I try to draw the card of, oh, otherwise we don't get innovation. I think regulation is part of innovation. So don't get me wrong here. Um, <clears throat> but I really think we have, we need the, the option of revising even the regulation. I see that Matthias and Virginia both want to reply as well. Uh, I was just uh, looking at the at the time and uh, noticing that we are nearly 60 minutes in. So after Matthias and Virginia, I will open up the floor for discussions or for questions also from the audience. We have four in the Q&A already. I think three of them by Bianca Schorl, we can collect them and uh, one by Johannes Leonard. Uh, um, um, be sure uh, we put you on uh, on, on stage. Uh, right after Matthias and Virginia's um, uh, replies. Matthias, first. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, I think it would, I mean, the, the, what we're trying to do as an organization, and we do um, do research. Uh, we um, um, also get research funding. And what we are doing there is we work with um, researchers from universities and uh, research organizations because we think the complexity of the um, topic that we're dealing with is so high that we need this exchange uh, it would be impossible to come up with good governance or regulation proposals if we were not doing this right um, because this is different from um, other fields, uh, not that, let's say, climate change is not complex, right? Um, but it's different from other fields because it's also, uh, there's, there's so much to learn about this at the moment. And, um, uh, and because we're doing that, I think, um, or it, it puts us in a position to have these discussions all the time that are interdisciplinary. And um, the one of the um, and everyone who is a scientist and has worked in these interdisciplinary uh, groups knows that one of the hardest things is the first, you know, six months or nine months in a project like this, you need to agree on a terminology and, um, and agree on what you're talking about. So um, I, for now, I'll try to take you up on this uh, honesty um, uh, term or idea, uh, Christian, and um, I, I think there is uh, some value to it, um, but maybe it's a deformation professionnelle, you know, working in a civil society organization and looking at all the, you know, BS that the companies are putting out and the rules that they do not follow, although they put, out, they put them out themselves, that I think there needs to be a leveled approach here. So I'm all for um, ethics guidelines uh, that companies put out because it's, very important for them to reflect on what they're doing and reflect hopefully with many of their staff and many of the developers and the engineers and you know everyone in the company but then the first thing that they need is an in-house governance system that uh, for example enables people to contest something that is being done in the company without risking their jobs you know which is the case at the moment and many of you know the cases of uh, Timnit Gebru and Margaret Mitchell who were fired from Google because they spoke out you know and let's not even get into the details of this discussion and, and the scientific discussion of their papers but uh, it, it just signals to everyone if you are critical of what your employer is doing then you will get fired that would be diff different in Germany I think you know not least because of labor regulations uh, so again there's another aspect that comes into it that no one is looking at um, uh, but it's important so um, the then but I'm all for this if we, you have these ethical guidelines and then you have a governance structure inside your company and it still needs to be accompanied by a co-regulatory framework that says and if you're not abiding by these rules that are transparent in the sense of that are published and you know people can understand them and can see what they mean then there is a limit to it there's a limit to what you can do um, and this is what is so hard to define 
um, because it can be different for many different products. And uh, again, this is why, for example, we need different rules for, let's say, using people analytics systems in the workplace and using uh, biometrics in, in other places. And I would like to make one more comment on that and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, and that is, um, it's a good example, the face recognition, because um, we have always argued that uh, prohibiting technologies is not a good idea. It's not a good way forward. Um, so we rarely ask to do this, but we have joined one um, campaign that is underway right now. It's called Reclaim Your Face. Uh, it was initiated by uh, IDRI and uh, Access Now, uh, other uh, civil society organizations, mainly active internationally and in Brussels. And what we are asking for in this campaign is that the EU will ban live, indiscriminate facial recognition in public places. So that's a very, you know, um, tailored definition of what we're talking about. I'm not talking about your phone recognizing your face to unlock, you know, to prohibit that. No, we are talking about live facial recognition indiscriminately in public places. And there is a, a very, very good argument to say, um, maybe this is already illegal under the GDPR, but if it isn't, you know, uh, there needs to be a clear regulation that it shouldn't be done because the risks much outweigh the possible um, the benefits of this. Virginia. Yeah, I think that uh, Matthias already said uh, several of the issues I would like to refer to, but uh, what I think, I really think that it's important to, to stress is that uh, it is not a question of regulation versus innovation or a question of uh, re uh, regulating in order to, uh, to limit uh, uh, possibilities. The, the only way forward, and if, if we take regulation as a kind of a limitation and putting impediments on one way or another, I already have discussed this, uh, the AI Act with some of the, the large uh, international companies, and they are taking it very much as a type of taxation. So we, in order to do what we want to do in, a, in Europe, we have to pay 4% or 6% or whatever it is, and then we, we pay it and we, we continue happily. So that's not the, cannot be what we want with regulation. It is, we really have to describe regulation as a stepping stone for innovation. And we have done that in many other industries before. And the one example, because I was working at that time in the auto industry, is the issue of the catalysts for cars. Catalysts were introduced by regulation into the, into the car uh, systems. And because of that regulation, which was taken by the car industry at the time, exactly as the AI industry is taking the GDPR and other regulation at the moment, as some kind of, this is going to limit us and we'll never be able to do and develop cars as good as they were now, as they were at that time, it was exactly because of that regulation, the, the filter in the exhaust pipe of the cars, that the car engines are now much more efficient, much more uh, um, clean, much more um, all kinds of ways because of the regulation. So we, there are many examples from many different industries in which regulation is really a stepping stone for better innovation. And this is the, the narrative that needs to be taken around the, the issues of regulation. Uh, of course, uh, I fully agree with what Matthias says in terms of how uh, internal uh, internal regulation or internal guidelines that companies need to be uh, taken and uh, how just writing, it's very easy to write this type of guidelines. I mean, it can take a lot of work and a lot of discussion between people, but at the end of the day, it's very, very easy to come up yet with yet another of this type of guidelines. And we have seen that. I think at this moment, there are over 600 of this type of documents around the world. Uh, if it doesn't come together with a culture, uh, really a culture change at uh, organization level, at uh, sector level, at national level, that it's not just about putting uh, nice words on paper, but it's really about implementing and operationalizing this, this, uh, um, this, uh, this nice words in ways that are really uh, 
changing the culture and changing the, the way we are working. It's no, it's no use to, to keep writing uh, yet another type of uh, guideline with yet another uh, order of nice words on it. We are now 21 minutes before the end of the uh, of the session, actually. So we're opening up the discussion for the general audience as well. And uh, in the Q and A, uh, already four questions uh, exist. Um, uh, three of them uh, by Bianca, who was first, and uh, I'll um, would give uh, her the opportunity to either um, ask the question in. Um, in in audio, or if she wants even to promote her to be pan to be co-panelist for the few minutes uh, and to be able to switch on video, however you want to, uh, Bianca. Bianca, please feel free to ask your question and let us know if you want to appear on video as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, of course, I'm happy to do so. If there's a button to do so, I'm not sure how. Um, Cynthia will try to promote you and uh, let you switch on the the video in the background. So. Uh, work now actually yes hello everyone and thank you so much for this very interesting talk uh i'm afraid i have many questions oh i guess my question disappeared now that i'm a host so i need to remember them <laughs> okay um so my first question was actually for virginia because you mentioned very briefly um the fact that for you is more important to regulate the impact of uh, ai based systems uh, rather than the technique that were used. And I was wondering, because that's something I'm really interested in, and I know you've been involved in some similar work uh, with standardization, for example. I was wondering whether this uh, is now considered as a largely accepted approach or whether it's something that is still at the starting point, uh, and if so, why? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I. I... I, I wouldn't dare to answer for all the different groups and all the different people involved. I think that there is uh, increasingly awareness that uh, regulation needs to be much more, uh, much more informed by the technical uh, capabilities, the technical uh, definitions. But at the same time, it's not about regulating a specific technique. It's, it's really regulating the impact. And I think that a lot of the organizations involved, the, the GPI or the, the European Union, uh, the UNICEF have also been working and even UNESCO with the, the new guidelines that are coming up recommendations. It's, it's increasingly about the impact of the technology on people, which makes it also increasingly more vague in terms of what are we addressing by this type of um, regulations or this type of uh, guidelines. So there is a, a difficult balance between being uh, focusing on impact uh, and becoming very vague or focusing on specific technologies and then becoming maybe less future proof or less um, efficient or less uh, useful than uh, when we talk about impact. So there is a, a, a difficult balance here, but I think that awareness is, is rising. Thank you very much. Uh, should I just go on with my questions or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so the easiest way. Otherwise, we need to demote you and promote you again. Uh, and yeah, that makes just, things much complicated. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my second question for my, was for Matthias, uh, because you were um, talking a lot about transparency. And I was wondering um, whether you had ever worked in a context where transparency turns out to be actually harmful for the end users uh, of AI based systems. And in which, in this case, uh, what do you actually advocate for? Because um, obviously there are regulations in place, but um, it's not always that easy, I guess. No, it's not at all. And I, 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 I hope I hoped I had already answered that question at least somewhat, because um, it's not like a general idea, you know, this transparency. Okay, so make public all the code and all the data. And if the data changes, make it public again, or so on and so forth. This can't work, you know, it depends on what we are talking about. Uh, so, yes, I mean, um, let's take a very, very simple example. I mean, simple in the sense of everyone knows it, not simple in the sense of, you know, how it is implemented and what, uh, what let's say knowledge is is in there uh, but it's search engines 
you know, if there were full transparency about how they work, they would become useless because uh, you have a billion euro industry of search engine optimizers who, if, you know, they knew what the criteria were exactly and how the thing works, how the system works, they would try to game it all the time uh, and the whole thing would sort of fall apart. So that would be harmful to people who want to use search engines, right? So this level of transparency there um, cannot be done in practice. Now, does this mean that there can be no transparency at all? No, I don't think so, because there is already a lot of explanation about what happens. And uh, maybe I can take a little detour and talk about this qualification of people and the expertise they have and what we envision that they would have. Uh, you know, it's very, very difficult. We are engaged a lot in educating the public about how these systems work. Work. I mean, this is part of our of our raison d'être, basically, as an organization. But of course, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that basically 95%, I'd say, maybe 98% of people who use Google as a search engine have no clue why, you know, the 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 um, search results or the results that come on top of the um, of the page when they type in a query, why they appear there, although there's a lot of well done um, information about this published uh, all over the internet. So I think most people would be able to understand at least the basics of it. So yes, there can be dangers in transparency. And um, then we would have to discuss the concrete case to be able to understand how we would find a good balance between uh, information that is made transparent, but not harm the users or uh, you know, even the vendors of the system because they also have rights. Thank you very much. That's super interesting. And my last question was for all of you actually, because um, you discussed um, the fact that companies might not actually want the uh, to have like, actually like to promote the well-being of users. But actually, I was also wondering about what about the state and is it um, necessarily assumed that uh, the state has a beneficial role, a moral role as an agent in the life of the individual when it comes to regulating um, AI and uh, whether you agree with that. If no one wants to move, I'm happy to make that move. <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, for me, um, AI research is not just about free market. It's really about research, very basic questions. You know, how, how can we simulate, if you want, um, intelligent behavior by algorithms? So, so I don't see why that is a market question or whatever. So um, now we may move and zoom in into companies, and I think I'm not the right person to talk about that there. Um, I still think that major parts there don't do that, but maybe as an organization, yeah, because you are a company. Um, so for me, and maybe I can use your question, what, what I meant with honesty, so, so I don't understand why we have to reinvent the wheel everywhere. So my um, my wife is a medical doctor and you have to go and get a certain certificate, right? We are not even asking for that in AI. And then you have to get every year particular number of points um, to show that you still try to educate yourself. Maybe we have to establish something like that in AI, companies, research, whatever as well. And maybe we have to even go for something like a Hippocratic Oath. I know it's not changing per se, life, but it would make us all aware and to some extent accountable. So in that sense, um, I can understand why you asked the question, because yes, it feels like, let, leave me alone. I just, I mean, leave, leave me and my circles alone. I just want to do research. I want to just do something. And that, no, I mean, we have a responsibility also as a researcher, in particular as a company. And that's what we have to um, go now for. Fine, fine with me. I'm not sure that I answered your question, but I I hope so a bit. Virginia and Matthias would like to also add to that. Otherwise, we um, thank you, uh, Bianca. But maybe. Yeah, actually, I I I'd like to because the. Um, 
I think I I'm taking a different approach here for many reasons than Christian, and this does not mean that I disagree. Uh, I, I just uh, think that um, there is this problem that you posed as a question. And I, for example, was at a conference today that was um, organized by the German Ministry for Justice and Consumer Protection. Um, and for example, there is a, I think, a reasonable uh, uh, argument to make uh, that when they merged the ministries for justice and consumer protection, whether that wasn't problematic in the first place, uh, because um, it sort of facilitates, facilitates the idea that consumer protection encompasses everything, which you could argue that, yeah, that's not a bad development, you know, but on the other hand, that risks uh, uh, understanding um, the entirety of our human life as uh, a market-driven activities, right? Which is exactly what um, capitalism in itself uh, imagined. Um, and I do think that uh, that is a risk that we are sort of, that we have been um, coming closer to or a situation that have, we have been coming closer to. So this is the way I understand your question. And I do think that um, there needs to be a rebalancing of these ideas of what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about an exchange of goods and services that needs to be regulated by um, the lawmaker? Or do we need to talk about a society that should be um, uh, structured in a way that uh, the citizens, not just the citizens, but everyone who lives in that society can, can uh, benefit from um, the, let's say, the, the, the wealth that uh, it has and not just uh, uh, some lucky few. So, um, I mean, that would only be uh, the beginning of an answer, but I, uh, I hope it also addresses at least partly the question that you posed. So I, I, think, I think we are very uh, aligned there. This is my, what I feel. But, but I have to jump in. I'm sorry for that. There was AI research. And what both of you now do is to narrow down AI research equals company equals economic interest. And what I'm just saying is, please, please, there is a large, large group of AI researchers that don't work for a company, that may even don't want to work for a company, whatever. But they, I mean, so what, what I, get, I, I get a bit nervous if people put me under the hat of Google, Facebook, and co. I'm not Google, I'm not Facebook, I'm not doing their research. I talk to some of my friends there, yes, but I'm very independent. So shouldn't we distinguish the people that make use of AI research or even do AI research as a company from those that do that at a university or in an independent way at least? And that's why I took the other position because sorry, I'm not waking up in the morning and think about how can I earn money today? Because that's the funny part being a food professor in Germany, I don't have to think about that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe if I can just uh, follow up. I fully agree with Christian, and indeed there is the whole field of uh, AI as a research field, which we really cannot stress enough that it's completely different or uh, very different from the AI as an economical factor. And in all these discussions that we are having nowadays, we are fix focusing on uh, AI as the economic driver and the societal driver and so on, and have much less um, uh, attention for the field of AI as a research field like uh, philosophy or biology or any many other of the research fields at universities or research institutes. But the, the other danger of your question or the other danger of type of answers to your question is that we are trying to put under the discussion of AI impact everything and anything that has to do with societal change and societal impact. Uh, how we want our governments to work, what kind of societies we want to, to have and so on, is something which we should be discussing independently whether or not AI is an effector in this, uh, in this uh, 
uh, discussion. So it, we really need to, and we really need to involve other people than myself as an AI researcher into the discussion. What kind of society do we want? What kind of uh, impact or what kind of uh, institutions we want to see in these societies? What kind of uh, um, of uh, factors and drivers for well-being we want to see in society? How we want our political uh, process and structures to be? Uh, I cannot answer these questions. I'm a computer scientist. I know how to build stuff, uh, maybe not even uh, much on that. And I discuss uh, AI impact, but it, this is only a very small part of those big questions. And we cannot hope to, uh, to put everything under the umbrella of what AI is doing in the world. Wonderful discussion. So we have six more minutes and two more questions. Uh, Leonard, uh, Johannes Leonard, Leonard is already joining us on stage. Uh, thank you, Bianca, uh, for these wonderful questions. Leonard, uh, Johannes Leonard, it's your um, turn. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your thoughtful discussion here. Uh, my question is related to what you just said or, uh, or discussed. Um, uh, and my question is, uh, is, is motivated by a comparison and the comparison to the Asilomar conference where, where scientists and, and notably publicly funded biologists uh, agreed on a moratorium on ge the genetic modification of humans. So this was well ahead of the technological possibility. And uh, anyway, uh, the point is that some of the participants later thought agreeing and, and uh, implementing such a moratorium was possible only because they were all publicly funded scientists. And they thought if companies with economic competition would have been there and it would have been an issue for them, it would have been too late on, for such a thing because the, the speed and pace of the companies is quicker, would have been quicker. And so my question is, do you think the case today in artificial intelligence is different? So all things you said are, I think, are, are very reasonable and, and many of them I would fully agree with and say that yes, this is what we wish, but maybe the reality is evolving at a quicker pace than our discussions. I, I just would be interested in one or two opinions whether this is the case or not. Uh, I think yes or no. Uh... We cannot be um, frozen by the fact that uh, uh, companies or the technology is moving. Uh, if, we, if, if we think that it's too late, then we are def by definition too late. Uh, if, we, if we think that uh, even uh, that something can be done and some type of uh, uh, regulation or governance needs to be done, even if uh, uh, if, if it had been done some years ago or some decades ago, it would have been different. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying it now. If we, if we stop trying or uh, if you stop defining the regulation and defining governance principles and defining what do we as societies accept or not accept from the, the type of technologies uh, uh, that we are, uh, uh, that are possible to use today, then uh, then we would be too late anyway. So I think that uh, it's not a question of would have been better before or would have been better later. No, we are now and it's now that we have to, to deal with these issues. And whether or no, not companies, uh, companies are also uh, uh, people. There is not, like there are no governments without people, there are also no companies without people. So we really need to, uh, to to discuss and to involve the, the companies in the in the discussion because the, the they are part of the of the the system if i make sense yeah so maybe maybe i can add something did did, did i interrupt you matthias sorry if i did that quite good um okay so first of all, um, there has been a letter on banning smart weapons, AI weapons, right? Signed by the major AI researchers. 
this letter now is rewritten in a sense again and people are signing it then you so so what i want to say with that it seems like yes you can find a large body of prominent ai research that uh, researchers that would sign something similar but i think what you're asking is what is the impact of that on whatever we are discussing now i would love to come back to this here because isn't it that we currently discuss also the crispr um, gene editing technology and that we have seen independently of whatever you have signed that there are people trying it